Hi, my name is Karen Lewis and I'm an English and Literature teacher at All Hallows School in Brisbane, Australia. Thank you for taking the time today to listen to me talk about my project that explored how we can use feedback conversations to motivate learning in adolescent girls. I have taught in girls education for my entire 15 year teaching career and I am a product of all girls education myself. I've been fortunate enough to be part of the inaugural Global Action Research Collaborative. It's given me the opportunity to explore two issues that are so important in girls education today, resilience and how we give feedback. Here are some images of the beautiful All Hallows School. Founded by the Sisters of Mercy, it's the oldest school in the state of Queensland and we're celebrating 160 years this year. We have almost 1600 students from grades 5 to 12. The school prides itself on its resources, including being at the forefront of technological educational advances. I've been particularly interested in feedback and how it can link to student confidence and resilience for quite some time now. It all stems back to a student I taught about 10 years ago named Sarah. Sarah was in my year nine English class. And this was back in the day where we used to give feedback on paper. Students would hand in a paper draft and we would write in the margins and give a global feedback comment at the bottom of the page. On this particular day, I returned drafts to my class and told them to read the feedback and ask me any questions that they might have. Sarah, unlike her classmates, wouldn't read it. Instead, she folded it in half, then in half again, and in half again, and she kept going until she could fold no longer. And then she shoved it in the bottom of her book bag. I went over and I asked her what was wrong. And she just looked at me and said, I hate reading draft feedback. It makes me feel so bad about myself. So I was both frustrated at the time that I had spent looking at her draft, but also really troubled for Sarah. Because what was happening for her that meant that she felt fearful reading draft feedback and then what learning was she missing out on because she was too scared to read it. The story of Sarah is familiar to many of us. So it was with frustration and compassion that I came to this study. I wanted to understand why we as teachers spent so much time giving feedback but some students don't engage with it or perhaps even purposefully ignore it. What's happening for them that means that they think that this is the best option? If, as educational researcher and feedback guru Dylan Williams says, the only thing that matters is what the student does with the feedback, then we as teachers need to look at how we can help students do something with the feedback. So let's listen to what William has to say. The really important thing is that when a student gets a piece of feedback, the first thing they do is think, not react emotionally, not disengage, but think. That's very important because what the research on uh, student motivation shows is that when they're faced with a task or with a responsive piece of work, students basically make a choice between deciding either to protect their well-being or to engage in activities that will actually help them grow as individuals and achievement. And if the first reaction of a student is to protect themselves and to restore their sense of well-being, what you'll find is the students focus on the things that will do that for them and they won't focus on the learning. So what we need to do is to give students feedback that helps them move forward, give them a feedback that makes it clear that ability is incremental rather than fixed. Because if we send the message to students that ability is fixed, then if you're confident of being able to engage in the task, you'll go for it for the brownie points. But if you're not confident or think that you might actually fail when other people will succeed, you will disengage. And basically, you, you will decide that you'd rather be thought lazy than stupid. Shields says something similar to William, that the emotions evoked from reading the feedback are so strong that they prevent the student using it to improve and develop. So I identified that Sarah and so many like her lacked resilience in the face of feedback and this transferred to their confidence. So before deciding what small difference I might make, the first place to go was the literature on the subject. I needed to consider three things. What helps to improve confidence? How do adolescent girls best learn? And what is best practice feedback? 
So in terms of what helps to develop confidence and resilience, a lot of the findings linked to Carol Dweck's work with growth mindset. There was a lot of literature out there on strong relationships between students and their teachers or mentors and also a need for students to be able to identify skill development themselves. In terms of how adolescent girls best learn, we all know that they are social learners, that they love to collaborate, and that they're motivated to learn if they think that people, especially their teachers, like them. And so then what does best practice feedback look like? Well, it's generally early in the learning process, it if it's student initiated, then they are more likely to take it on board and they really appreciate it when it's personalised rather than being generic or whole class feedback. In addition, and this links particularly to girls, the use of dialogue or conversations can be really important. So then it just became a matter of combining these three findings. What's really interesting to note, though, is that there really isn't a lot out there on these topics that's related specifically to girls' education. So this really showed me that we need to explore this for the girls we teach. So I came up with three specific areas that I wanted to research. What type of student engagement with the feedback leads to receptive uptake? What type of student engagement with the feedback improves confidence? And can feedback conversations encourage students to use feedback to improve their writing? So you can see here that I used my findings from the literature to design a conversational feedback intervention strategy. Basically, rather than giving the feedback in propositional form like we usually do, the feedback would be clarified by the students. I would give further explanation as needed and then students would apply it. The idea was that I would tap into girls as social learners and their need for positive relationships through having feedback conversations with them. So that students would have a record of the feedback conversation that we had, I designed this table that we would simply place at the bottom of a student OneNote page. After having the conversation back and forth and being recorded, students would finally annotate their own work, identifying the skills that they had developed, for me to have a look at. I was fortunate enough to be teaching two year 11 literature classes over the course of this study. So in the interest of equity, I offered all 36 students the opportunity to engage with the conversational feedback intervention. I collected data in a variety of different ways, as you can see here. It's important to note that not all students selected to participate in the feedback conversations. Those who didn't generally cited the perception of it taking too much time as their reason for not being involved. Those who did take part though, did so in a variety of different ways. So here's an example of one way that students chose to engage in the feedback conversation. Here, I provided some feedback, the student engaged in some clarification, and then I responded. This student, however, chose not to do the final step of the annotations. Here's another way that some of the students chose to engage with the feedback conversation. This student didn't feel that she needed to clarify anything, so she jumped straight from receiving feedback from me to annotating her work. So you can see that she's highlighted, she's annotated at the side, and then I was able to respond to those annotations down the bottom of the page. So even though she didn't need to seek clarification, we still ended up engaging in some conversation around her work. And finally, some students chose to engage in a feedback conversation a little bit differently. They did an initial piece of work, I gave them some feedback on that, and then rather than annotating the original piece of work, what they did was apply those feedback comments that I made on the first piece of work to a second piece of work. And so that's what this student has done here. And you can see again, she's annotated it, and then I've responded to her annotations. Those who participated in the conversational feedback model were overwhelmingly positive in their response to it. As you can see here in some of the transcriptions from the focus group discussions that we had, students referred to it as being really helpful or that it wasn't all that much effort or that it felt useful. And the one that I liked the most here was the student who said spending the time on it and being able to see how it improved her writing was so useful that she'd actually do it for all of her subjects. 
So it certainly appears that they started to do something with the feedback and were having a more positive emotional response to it, as both Williams and Shields suggest that they should. Prior to introducing the conversational feedback model, I surveyed the students about their confidence levels before taking an essay exam. And that's the orange that you can see on the graph there in front of you. You can see that there are far more students who reported being concerned about their exam than who reported being confident about it. Then after we'd been using the conversational feedback model for about eight weeks, I surveyed the students about their confidence levels before their next essay exam. And that's the green on the graph in front of you. As you can see here, their self-reported confidence levels certainly increase from pre to post intervention. So I also looked at student grades. Here is a direct comparison of the average grades awarded to students in those two essay exams that I was referring to before. Again, pre-intervention being the orange and the post-intervention being the green. The skill development is clear. Those who sought feedback improved that's the first two sections there of the graph. But those who engaged in feedback conversations improved more significantly. Those who didn't seek feedback at all actually saw a reduction in their grade. So now I'm looking at refining this process and encouraging more student buy-in. As the feedback conversations didn't really take any longer from a teacher perspective, it's now just about getting the students to see the benefits of it and understanding that it isn't more work for them at all. That in fact, feedback conversations are really useful to their learning, to their confidence and to their resilience. It's just about a mindset shift. But from my perspective, it's also about having a positive impact on all the Sarahs out there. Engaging in feedback conversations might be something that you would like to try as part of your own feedback practice. I used it for essay writing and I engaged mainly in written conversations, but you could use it for feedback for any aspect of student learning. And if you engage in a spoken conversation, just record it for students to go back to again later. I'd love to hear how you go with it. I'm going to leave you today with the letter one of my students wrote me at the start of 2021. I usually start the school year by asking my students to tell me something about themselves and how I can support their learning. This student had been in my class when I first implemented the feedback conversations and totally unprompted, she said, I think you could help me by giving me the same feedback type that you gave last year. I thought that was a pretty positive endorsement. I hope you found my presentation useful and that maybe you've got some ideas for your own feedback practices. I look forward to chatting to you during our allocated time or welcome any emails. My email address is there on the screen. Thank you for your time. So congratulations, Karen. It must feel like um, quite a long um, year to 18 months that you've um, been doing your action research project during a pandemic and everything. You know, how do you feel now that it's all over? I actually feel really satisfied with what I think all nine of us as part of the Global Action Research Collaborative have actually achieved in what has been a, you know, a trying 18 months. But for my own personal project, I've been really fortunate living in Australia. We haven't had the challenges that other countries around the world have, but I feel really satisfied and really proud of what we've achieved and what we've discovered and really hopeful for the future for what, how we can help our students. Was that an important part of the process for you, the fact that it was um, a global action research collaborative? So you're all working on your own different projects around the theme of feedback, but that you were able to see what was happening in other parts of the world, especially with the pandemic happening, that, that you were still able to bounce ideas off each other and learn from their experiences. Yeah, absolutely. It was great to be able to talk to colleagues from around the world who might have just been able to say to me, why don't you try this? Or I've done this before. Um, we shared literature with each other. I found this really great paper. Would you like to have a look at it too? I think it would help you with what you're trying to discover. Um, so that was incredibly helpful. And also just knowing that other people were working to the same deadlines, were trying to support their students in similar ways. It was, it was a really great feeling of collegiality. And how did you come up with your idea? Obviously, the theme of the pilot GARC project was 
was feedback. And was that something that had been on your mind? Like what attracted you to applying in the first place? So in the English department at All Hallows School, we've been working with feedback for a number of years now, um, just looking at how we can better give the students feedback so that they are more receptive to it. So it's something that's been on my radar anyway. And um, I'm sort of, you know, there's always that frustration as, as a teacher when you give what you believe is really good and really helpful feedback and the students don't engage with it. And it could be for a number of reasons. It could be because it, you know, doesn't make them feel good about themselves or it could be because they don't understand the feedback or perhaps that they don't know how to apply it but we're constantly faced with that so we had been exploring it for a while and we had a number of different ideas for things that we could do so I was particularly attracted to this study because it gave me a way of formalizing some of the ideas that I already had it gave me a really clear structure and a clear framework and I think as well it kept me honest in terms of I had to do the data analysis. It wasn't just this gut feel of, well, I've made these changes and I think it's working. The, it kept me honest in doing the data analysis that then actually supported what my gut was already telling me. And did you find that the pandemic had much effect? Did it change your study in any way? It changed, it changed the student um, involvement I think I actually, I ended up going back to and collecting data from the start of 2020. So I looked at pre, the pre, pre-pandemic and I looked at how many pieces of feedback the students sought. So, you know, how many different pieces of writing were they giving um, and seeking feedback on? And around April 2020, it dipped significantly and it never quite came back. So I was absolutely dealing with students who, for whatever reason, it might have been you know, their own emotional well-being, their perception of time, whatever it might have been, that they weren't seeking the feedback in a way that they had prior to the pandemic. So that was a challenge. Um, and I'm hopeful that the strategies that I employed sort of will be something that can help them going forward now as well. And in terms of um, how that impacted on your study, I think you found some interesting results that, you know, some of the girls really engaged with, you know, the feedback um, corrections that you were giving them, um, but others, they seem to almost back off from, from the whole exercise. Yeah, and that was that was a really interesting finding for me, and that's that's actually why I went back to have a look at well, what were they doing pre-pandemic? What was quite interesting to me was that there was this group of students who the pandemic didn't actually appear to impact them at all. They and they were the ones who were already resilient. They were the ones who had the growth mindset, and they just kept going. And then there were those who dipped off. Um, and they were a little bit harder to get back and to get them involved in the feedback. So I do think that we've got some long-term impacts, even here in Australia, where you know, we have not had the issues that the rest of the world has had. We've been incredibly fortunate. But even, even with you know, the five-week lockdown that we had in Brisbane, I do think that has had a long-lasting effect on a number of our students. It is almost a microcosm of broader society, isn't it, that some people seem to be incredibly resilient and they've just gone with the flow, whereas for others, it really has impacted them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that in itself is actually, that that's room for a, a bigger study. I'd be fascinated to have a look at, at why and mine sort of, you know, my study only deals with this tiny little aspect of it, but absolutely it's really interesting to see those people who already are resilient how they responded to challenging times and do you have any gut feeling about that that you know looking at the girls in your study who were really resilient do you have any gut feeling about why that might have been the case or is it something that you really don't know and 
you would need to um, perhaps do further research to try and find it out because it would be such an interesting thing to find out, wouldn't it? Look, my gut feeling, and you're right, it is, it's incredibly interesting. My gut feeling is, is that these are the students who they see this as learning for the sake of learning. It's not learning for the sake of achieving a result. So for them, they're still just going along as they normally would. Well, I'm still learning. I'm just learning in a different way. I'm learning online or my teacher's doing this differently and I'll just keep going. But those who place so much value in a mark, when things changed for them, changed the way that school was delivered or changed the way that feedback was delivered or there's this perception of a lot of outside pressure, um, then they were the ones who, where there's a, that extrinsic carrot at the end that they're actually looking to achieve, when things change for that path to get there, I think for me, I think they were the ones who showed less resilience than those who were just didn't, I like learning and here's what I want to keep doing. It, that's pure speculation on my part. That's such an interesting insight. Um, so when it came to, to writing up, you know, the results of, of your action research project, I'm assuming then that you had to take account of, you know, the unexpected events of 2020. Yeah, I did. And I made sure that I sort of, I, I mentioned all of that in there because I didn't have the uptake of the engagement with the feedback in the way that I thought I would. I thought I would have all 36 students who I was working with would absolutely 100% engage with what I was doing. So I really had to, for some of them, I had to kind of push and prod a little bit to say, oh, come on, come and do this. This is going to really help you. Um, and then some just did not want to be a part of it at all. And that's yeah, that's fair, but I thought I would have a bigger uptake than what I did. I still wound up with a good third of them engaging really meaningfully with it, but they were the ones that I suspect might have already been engaging with it anyway. So do you think then that you have still learned like really valuable uh, lessons and information out of your action research project that you can take forward? Yeah, I, I really do. And so what what I'm going to be working with a number of other teachers in, in the All Hallows English department this year, we're going to use some of those findings and we're going to try and capture some more data now that, you know, we're sort of 12 months on. We're going to try those same processes, give feedback in this conversational way with a bigger group of students and see if the data that we collect regarding that supports what I found with my smaller cohort last year. So I do think it works, but we're going to, we're testing it this term, we're testing it. But obviously there's been interest from your colleagues then and what you found originally and, and now they, they're interested in applying it to a broader group of students. Yeah, my colleagues have been incredibly supportive um, the whole way through and I've had lots of questions as I've been going, what are you finding? What are they doing? Is this working? Because it is something that as a group we have been working with for quite some time anyway, we've been looking for reasons to, to change and how can we change and reasons why the students aren't engaging. So they were really interested. What are you finding? Have you got anything that we can all use? So now we're trialling it on a slightly larger scale to see what happens. Oh, that's great. Um, and I understand also that um, your time with um, GARC, as we call it, isn't coming to an end, that you are now helping mentor the next cohort coming through so clearly you um, had a, a great experience with the whole um, process. Oh absolutely and when the, I was asked would I be interested in mentoring a group so I've got five people from around the world there's some Australians in there and there's um, a couple of people from the UK as well um, and working with them has been a really great way for me to learn how to support others, like learn how to be a mentor. But there's so many things that I can, I look at what they're doing and go, no, wait, don't do that. I made that mistake. And so it's been, it's, I think it's really good to be able to give a little bit back 
And then I'm also learning as well. So then I can then support perhaps my own colleagues in my workplace as well. So had you done any action research before or did you come to this as, you know, completely a new thing for you to do? I had done some action research before in in a formalised way. I, I think as teachers, I think we're always engaging in action research. We often just don't formalise it. You know, often, you know, oh, this is not working. Why is it not working? I might try this and, you know, here's why I think this will work. So I think we do that all the time as teachers. Um, but I have engaged in some more formalised action research before. Um, most recently, a, a couple of years ago, a colleague of mine, um, she approached me and said, this year 10 English unit, it's not working let's do something about it. And so we actually looked at a lot of literature and we explored how we can um, use collaboration. Another thing that girls learning particularly is really important too. Um, So we looked at how collaboration can um, support students through understanding a novel. And so that worked really well and we've um, presented our findings of that um, a number of times now as well. So, yeah, I have engaged in some um, and it's real. I think it's really important to be able to formalise the process so you can actually say, look, this is what I found, not just that gut instinct. And what do you think maybe was different about, you know, this most recent one that you've done with, with GARC, the Global Action Research Collaborative? How do you feel that this was different perhaps from other action research that you've done before? For the first time, I think I was, because I was walked through the process, I was taught how to analyse my data. I was given a really clear, structured approach. So it wasn't just, I I think if we try this and then I think we might look at the data in this way, it was a very formalised process, which I think was really useful. And I've taken a lot out of that, that I'll be able to apply in the future. Um, so it sounds like you're um, a really great ambassador for GARC then. Clearly, you know, you got a lot out of the process and, and perhaps would encourage others to take it up. Oh, absolutely. Anyone who is interested absolutely should apply. It is wonderful. It really is probably one of the best forms of professional development that you could do. And it's not, you know, an actual university course. It's, you know, you're not enrolling. It's more that you are collaborating with colleagues around the world and they're supporting you and you're being trained how to undertake action research. Yeah, which is like that's the thing that we do as teachers. Um, That's the best thing that you can do to grow and to develop and to improve your your own practice. I think more than the formalised study, I think this is the way to become a better teacher. And I think, you know, I think you would also say that it's also benefiting the girls, that it, at the end of the day, this is about helping the girls. And so you've learned a lot about feedback and you'll take that forward with you. Absolutely. Well, yeah, it's been, it's been just wonderful. Oh, well, that's, that's so great to hear, Karen. I'm glad you've had such a great experience. And um, it's wonderful now that you've become a mentor yourself. And uh, we'll look forward to perhaps catching up with you in the future and seeing where it's taking you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jen.